So this is part three of the practice exam. Sorry about that. And um, this one we do a little bit of graphing, some sine trigonometry, and some exponent, exponential functions. So let's take a look at this as number 10. So it's given the following trigonometric function. State the amplitude, the period, the phase shift, the vertical translation. And on the next page, they want you to graph it. So the first thing you should always be really careful with is this. You see how this is written like this? Rewrite it by factoring out that 3 or you're going to have an improper phase shift, right? Okay, so I'm going to write this as y equals minus 2 sine, take out the 3, x plus 30 degrees. Okay, so now I have a proper phase shift here. See, it's going to go left 30 degrees. Let's put that in here. Left. It's on a little line here in my paper. What is the amplitude? The amplitude is 2. Don't say minus 2. The amplitude is always a positive length. It just means it's been reflected, right? So the graph, instead of going this way, it's going to go this way, right? Okay, so I have 2, the period. The period is defined by 360 divided by k. So that's 360 divided by 3, which you should know right away would be 120 degrees. Vertical translation, there is no vertical translation. Okay, it would say plus 1, plus 2, something like that here. No, no vertical translation. There's a vertical stretch by a factor of 2, but that's not what a translation is asking you for. So there's no vertical translation. Next page. So sketch the function clearly on below, clearly showing the scale that you used. Okay, so the scale you want to use, <coughs> sorry, we have to sketch, um, let's get that function back here because it's not on that page. So I have y equals minus 2 sine 3x plus 30 degrees. Okay, so I know it's a negative sine function. I know it's been shifted to the left 30 degrees. A mapping rule is always a good idea. Always take your time to do a mapping rule and use some points that you can, uh, you can think about here, okay? So my mapping rule would say the regular function x and y are going to change to, I'm going to divide my x's by 3. See, this is this one, x divided by 3 minus 30 degrees and I'm going to do minus 2 times the y values. Now you could use this and find every little point. For this graph it's not necessary. For one that your teacher might ask you it might be because I know that this is moving to the left 30 degrees so I'm going to start it here and I've already said that the period of this function is 120 degrees. That was 360 divided by 3. So I'm going to use these as 30s. So this is going to be minus 30, 0, 30, 60, 90, 120, 150, 180, 210. It's going to be far enough. Now the amplitude is 2. There's no vertical translation so that means the axis of symmetry is still going to be the x-axis. It's going to go down first because it's negative. So I'm going to go down and every, because the period is 120 degrees, so every quarter of that, which is the way we divide up those, those graphs very nicely, is going to be 30 degrees. So this is going to go down to minus, uh, sorry, minus 2. So minus 2 here. Then it's going to go back to 0. It's going to go up 2. It's going to go back to 0. And you can see now that I've gone from minus 30 to 90, which is 120 degrees. So in perfect quarters. So it's going like this. And you could do another series, another um, period of the function. Um, you might be asked to show two full cycles. That would be something like that. Okay, so there's my graph. Number 11, given the series 800, 400, 200, 100, determine, I don't know what this was supposed to be, determine using the appro appropriate formulae, so don't guess, T12 to three decimal places. So T12, remember when you're doing, um, when you're using 
sequences in series. This is a geometric. So I'm going to write that in here. I know it's geometric. Sometimes a teacher might just ask you that little question. And make sure that you do the ratio the right way. You might say, oh, it's, it's two times. Well, it's not two times, it's a half, right? Because I have to do this over this, this over this, this over this. So my R is one half and my A is 800. And if I want to know the 12th term to three decimal places. So T n equals a times r to the n minus 1. So t12 is going to be a times r to the n minus 1. That's going to be the power of 11. Really hard on my pencils. Okay, so if you do that properly, and I've already done it so I could save a bit of time here, I get um, 0.3 nine one to three decimal places okay so now the next question says what's the sum of 12 what is the sum of 12 so you have a couple of different formulas you can use this one so i have a to the a times r to the n minus one this is probably the one you're most likely to use r minus one i plug in 800 r is a half to the 12th power, I'm going to need another set of brackets, minus 1 over 1 half minus 1, and that's why we have calculators, and you should get 1,599.609375. So to one decimal place, boom, get rid of that. Okay, that's one formula. You could also use the other formula, Sn equals Tn plus 1 minus t1 over r minus 1 and you can find the next term which means just multiply it um, by a half again and you would get 0.1953125 minus 800 divided by minus 0.5 you'll get the very same answer okay so your choice whatever one you like um, the next question on the grid below, and you didn't have a grid, so I made one here for us for the test. It says, sketch the graph of y equals 2 to the 3x plus 6 plus 1, along with its parent function. So what's the parent function, you ask? That's the first thing. Let's graph the parent function. The parent function is this is my base, so it's y equals 2 to the x. That's the parent function. So you should know um, 2 to the minus 1 is a half. So I'm right here at a half. Anything to the power of 0 is 1. To the power of 1 is 2. 2 squared is 4. And that's about all I'm going to get on here. Maybe I'll start to set just a little more. Minus 2, so that would be like a quarter. Right? So here's my graph of y equals 2 to the x. Okay, now they want me to sketch the graph of this though. So now I have to look to the numerator, to, uh, the numerator. Yeah, I'm looking up here. I, I see there's a mistake here in the way I'm going to write it. I want to factor out that three. Don't forget there's, uh, that's probably the only mistake you're going to make if you, um, if you're not careful with these um, factoring, right? So this is a, the X changes here and this is the Y. The 2 is the parent function. Don't think that is a stretch or something, right? We started with that. If it was a stretch, it would be like this, 2, 2 to the x, right? It's not even in the question. Okay, so x and y are going to go to, I'm going to divide my x's by 3. Remember, x's are weird, so it looks like multiply. You divide and subtract 2. And to my y, I'm just going to add 1. So now what I would suggest is that you pick a few points that are easy to use. Um, you might want to think about what value would give me um, x is, when, when x is 0, where am I on this axis? So that would be, x would have to be um, 6, right? So if I put in 6 here, I would get x is 0. So that would be, um, that would be an option of something you might want to do. I think I, that was a minus, that was a minus six up there, right? I didn't see that correctly. It should be a minus two. 
this is a plus 2, so that would mean minus 6. So when x is minus 6 for the parent function, remember these values here for the parent, right? And we transform them to get the new graph. So when x is minus 6, I would have 2 to the negative 6. That's 1 over 64, isn't it? Sure it is. And minus 6 divided by 3 is negative 2 plus 2 would be 0, and 1 and 1 over 64. So I did that just because I wanted to know where it would be on the graph of this function. So 0 and 1 and 1 over 64, that's just like a hair above this one, right? It's almost going through through 1. 1 64th, that's pretty hard to, to, um, to find. Okay, let's do some other values. Let's do when x is um, uh, minus 1, the parent function would have been a half. So that would give me 2 and, uh, sorry, 1 and 2 thirds, 1 and 2 thirds. I put a negative 1 here, minus a third plus 2. So that's 1 and 2 thirds, and a half and 1 is 1 and a half. If I did the point 0 and 1, those are always easier ones to do, right? I would get 2 and 2. If I did when x is 1 and y was 2, I would get 2 and a third and 3. And let's do one more. When x is 2, y would have been 4. Remember, these are all the parent fa parent value functions. So 2 to the x. 2 squared is 4. And I would get 2... Oh, where'd I go? 2 thirds. 2 and 2 thirds. So this isn't going up very fast. And 4 plus 1 is 5. So then what you want to do is graph these points here. So I have 2 and 2. 2, it's not very good, uh, 2 and a third and 3, so it's going up quite fast here, it's because it's um, shifted up 1, right, 2 and 2 thirds and 5, 2 and 2 thirds and 5, so it's coming down like, like this, ooh, that's really bad, it doesn't even look right, does it? Let me see, did I do the right points here? 2 and 2. Oh, no, 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 no. I had a 2 and 2. And 2 and a third and 3. And 2 and 2 thirds and 5. And 1 and 2 thirds. And this looks like... Um, minus 1, minus third, 1 and 2 thirds. And half and 1 is 1 and a half. Okay, so one and two thirds and one and a half. I should have been about here. Coming down like this. So let's try one more over here. What did we have? Um, we're going to have to do something really small. Let's say we had uh, nine, negative nine. Negative 9 and 1 to the power of negative 9 is 1 over something really small. Let's not even worry about how small that is. So minus 9 would give me minus 3 plus 2 is minus 1 and 1 and a little tiny bit, right? So minus 1 and 1 and a little bit. So it's coming down like this, just like that. Okay, it's kind of messy. Sorry about that, but I didn't have a graph to work with and... This is kind of scribbly. Okay, so this question here, find the inverse of this. Remember to find the inverse. So let f at x equal y, and then we change the values. We'll let x be y and y be x. Okay, so I'm going to write for inverse, switch variables. You should write that in your notes while you're doing it so the teacher knows why you did what you did. Okay, and now I have to solve for y, which is going to be my inverse. So, um, first I'm going to um, move the 3 over. So I have x minus 3 equals minus 2 times y minus 1 squared. And then I'm going to divide by minus 2. So I'll just do it here like this. That's going to cancel out here. And then I'm going to take the square root. 
when you take the square root, don't forget you get plus or minus in front of it. And that's going to be equal to y minus 1. And finally, that's going to be y equals, I bring the 1 over. So I have 1. Where did I get a 1 from? It was supposed to be, a, yeah, it's a 1. It's minus 1. Oh, I did something wrong here. This was a plus here, right? See, it was a plus. I scrub. I put the wrong number there. Okay, so that comes over here, and now I'm going to have y equals negative one plus or minus the square root of x minus three over minus two. Okay, number fourteen. Prove the following trigonometric identity. Remember, when you're doing identities, you want to break the parts down into their smallest parts. So tan is sine over cox, right? This one, I'm going to leave that alone. So left side is going to be equal to sine theta over cos theta plus 1 over tan theta. So i got to flip it over, right? So that's cos theta over sine theta. That's 1 over tan theta. And in order to add these together, I need a common denominator. So I'm going to use cos theta sine theta as my denominator. This is looking kind of positive because look what's on the right side. Same thing, cos times sine, sine cos. Okay, so if I add the common denominator here, that meant I multiplied this by sine theta to get sine squared theta. This is times cos. So I'm doing times cos theta. This is times cos theta. This is times sine theta. Let me just write that in there for you. This is times sine theta, right? Okay, so sine theta, sine squared theta plus cos squared theta, and you know this identity is equal to 1. And there you go. You can write this in any order you want. And the right side is equal to 1 over sine theta cos theta. Therefore, left side equals right side, and you have proven your identity. That was a pretty easy one, wasn't it? Don't you wish you'd teach proof that one on your exam? Okay, now we're down to the last and final page, finally. I'm racing through this because I have so much to do. The inside temperature of a building is modeled by this, where T is the temperature in degrees and T is the number of hours since 5 a.m. The graph is shown below, right here. Using an appropriate calculation, explain why the coefficient of t in the equation is 15. Why is it 15? Well, because you know that the entire period is a full day, so 24 hours. So t equals 24 hours is the, um, is the period, right? It's 24 hours. So... 360 degrees divided by 24 gives me 15. And that's why we have 15 here. Um, there we go. Okay, so how many hours a day is the temperature in the building below 22 degrees centigrade? Well, just find it on the graph. Right? So here, and then I go down. And 22 here, I go down. And how long is it before, between that? And I wrote these in a little earlier because it's every three hours. So this is 11 to 11. So how many hours a day? 12 hours, right? 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. And that's done. Okay, it says in another building, the temperature fluctuates in a similar manner, except that the maximum temperature is 27 and the minimum is 23. Determine the defining equation that models the temperature in this other building. Okay, so what's different now? What is different? What have we done differently here? Well, um, the max and the min, it goes from 27 to 23. So my graph is up here now, right? 27 to 23. So... It'd be coming down like that. So that means my amplitude is going to change. So 27 to 23, that's only, that's four. It fluctuates four degrees. Whereas this one, um, so my amplitude is only going to be two, right? Because the, the, sorry, the total fluctuation is four degrees. So the amplitude is half of that. I hope I didn't make a mistake on that in, uh, in your notes earlier. So this was three degrees from here to the axis. 
this is the amplitude here, right? I think I did that wrong in the test. You can tell me in the notes below. Okay, so this is only two, and now it's only going to be, um, it's only going to be two. This should have been three. So this went from, what do we got here? It's hard to read the graph. So that's like 19 to 25. So this had six. So the amplitude was equal to three. Whereas in this one, it's four degrees spread. So the amplitude is equal to two, four over two. Okay, and that means the axis is going to be in between these two. Right, so between 23 and 27, subtract 2 or add 2 to this one, it's going to be at 25. So how does that affect the equation? Well, temperature time t is going to be 2 instead of 3. Cos, it has the same period, but the axis is going to be at 25. Okay, and finally the last question, number 16. Hobbies often complete with, compete, compete with their model rockets to determine which rocket flies the highest. On one test launch, a rocket was fired vertically upward. The angle of elevation to the top of the flight was measured from two points that were 20 meters apart on the same side as the launch site. That's important. The angles measured the two points Angles measured at the two points were 66 and 37 degrees. How high did the rocket fly to the nearest meter? Okay, I forgot to do this one, but we can do it very quickly. So we have a launch pad here. And the rocket goes up. Vertically upward. The angle of elevation to the top of the flight. So straight up. So we're going to go out from here. This was 20 meters. And we don't know the height. We know how far apart we are, sorry. So we're 20 meters here. 20 meters apart. Two points that were 20 meters apart. Okay, so it didn't say, didn't say how far they were from here. It just said they were 20 meters apart. So you have one measured up to here and one measured up to here. We don't know what this is. We just know this length here. Okay, so the angle of elevation, the angles measured at the two points were 66 degrees. That would be this one here. And the other one over here is 37 degrees. So the question is, how high did the rocket fly? We're trying to find this length here. So we have a, a two-part question here because we don't know this length here, although I wrote that on the question first, but we do know this one here, and we have, we know 20, we have this angle, and we could figure out the other angles in this triangle very easily because this is, um, just has to subtract from 180, so 180 degrees minus 66, is 114 degrees. So that's here, 114 degrees. And add 37 to that, 151. That gives us 19 degrees up here. Okay, so if I want to find this side length here, because I want to know, I want in the end I want to find this height here. I don't know why I put 20 here either. This is my x. I want to know how high did the rocket fly. So if I can find this length, then it would just be opposite over hypotenuse. So the sine of 66 degrees is what I'm going to find in the end. That's going to be x over, and that will be y, which I'm going to find first. So how do I find y here? Well, I have this angle. I have this angle and this side length. So I have this angle. I want to find this side length. So you can use sine law, right? I didn't send it up very well for you. So I'm going to use sine law to find this side length here. So we'll say y over the sine of 37 degrees, y over the sine of 37 equals 20 over the sine of 19 degrees. So y is equal to sine 37. So remember the end pattern? 
sine 37 times 20 divided by the sine of 19 degrees. So I need my calculator because I didn't, I don't know why, I just didn't see that question. So I'm going to do sine 37, close the bracket, times 20 divided by the sine of 19 degrees. And I get 36.97. So they went to the nearest meter. So I'm going to say it's approximately 37 um, meters. Because so that's 20 meters. This is going to be meters. So now I have this other little triangle here. I have sine of 66. Now that I have this 37, which is my y, so sine 66 degrees equals x over 37. So x is 37 times the sine of 66 degrees. So I'm just going to leave that number I had in here times the sine of 66. And I get 33.77 to the nearest meter. So it's about 34 meters. And that's, that's possible, right? Okay, so that concludes your final exam review. Um, I hope you appreciate this. Um, give me a little thumbs up or comment. I'm still planning to do the advanced functions course for the fall for next year. So if you're taking advanced functions, make sure you subscribe to the channel so that you'll be getting notices when the videos start coming online again. Good luck with your exam. Hope this helps you out. Don't forget to study some finance if your teacher says she's going to have finance on there as well. So, you know, get your teacher to give you a good outline and best of luck. Bye.